Well, hey, good morning, everyone. So good to be with you today. Um, it's good to be with you, Story Church. And as Travis mentioned, uh, we go back a little bit, but it's, uh, it's kind of a different, different lens in a way. I was talking to Stephen Gordon this morning, just walking around campus and just realizing all that goes into kind of setting up church on a Sunday morning. And so I'm looking forward to, to learning uh, from you all as I start in this process of planting. But man, I, I'm so grateful for you as a church. I'm grateful for your pastors, Travis and Stephen, their families, and, and all you are doing in the city uh, for the gospel. And um, I'm grateful to be here uh, preaching this very important passage, as you just heard. And so as we dive in here um, to this passage in Mark 15, um, you know, it's made me kind of think deeply about how, uh, you know, in many ways, we are so collectively taken by a good mystery. I'm not sure if you guys enjoy mystery novels, good movies uh, with suspense, maybe a little bit of a, a surprise ending. I think the last one that I saw that was just really great was that Knives Out movie. Just like, it was, it was great, good, good movie. Um, if you haven't seen it yet, I encourage you to check that out. But it, there's something about a good surprise ending that that we don't see coming, that really captures us in, in a way. And, and I think about there's, there's this kind of compelling and thrilling lead up where maybe you're, you're even along for the ride where the story just kind of goes in places and you're not sure exactly what's happening. You can tell there's bits of information that's missing. And you're so taken though by the story, you're so taken by the characters that are being developed within that, you're still kind of on the edge of your seats. And, and we're tuned in and we're watching with intensity. And finally, there's, there's a turn in the narrative and there's some bit of missing information that gets presented in that book or that movie and it all kind of makes sense. And, and you realize that, that Bruce Willis was dead the whole time, right? Spoiler, sorry, that movie's been out for a long time, but uh, the identity of Kaiser Soze is finally revealed, right? There's, there's this information that would have been helpful the whole time. And it kind of changes the way that you see the whole story. It changes the way that you, you experience that whole thing. It's kind of like that thousand piece uh, puzzle that maybe you tried out during COVID and you brushed off and you put on your dining room table and things start to take shape in different ways. And that, that elbow that you thought was an elbow is actually a nose. And you know that, that secondary character who is like not really important was actually the puppet master pulling the strings the whole time. And we realized that there's more to the story. Now, I want to suggest to you this morning that as you have been walking through the book of Mark, that in a way, the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ in Mark 15 and 16 is that bit of information that you were missing that you didn't even know that you were missing. There, there's something incredibly, profoundly powerful and important about this story that really sits as the center cog of the whole gospel. And it's the lens that we needed as you have walked through Mark, as you viewed every conversation, every bit of, you know, you know all those things that Jesus said that were kind of mysterious and like, why did he say that that way? Well, it's, it's all, it all makes sense in light of what happens here in Mark 15. In fact, I want to challenge you, I would encourage you to perhaps even reread the book of Mark with the end in mind. It's, it's fascinating to think about, to review how the cross and the empty grave informs every single thing that happens in the book of Mark. So I'd go further and say that this chapter, this conclusion of Mark, helps us understand the entirety of Scripture in a different way. And, and so this is the big idea that I want to point us to. If you guys are note takers, if you want to uh, pull out your phone and jot down some things, here's the big idea that I want to point us to this morning, that the cross of Christ is the key to unlocking the redemptive plan for every single one of us. I believe that the cross of Christ is the key to unlocking the redemptive plan for every single one of us as we look at Mark 15. Mark has been trying to help us understand that Jesus is the Christ, that he is God in human flesh and who dies on our behalf so that we can have life everlasting. That has been Mark's goal. And this is the gospel. This is the good news that Jesus died for us so that we can live. And so this morning, as we walk through this narrative that Mark points us to in chapter 15, Mark provides for us some, some ways for us to understand how this death on the cross occurred. And as you just heard, it's sobering, it's, it's violent, but it's necessary. And it is the crux of this gospel message that we, we know and love as Christians. Hey, um, if you have your Bibles, before we get to Mark 15, though, I want to present to you a companion piece in Psalm 22. 
Many of you know Psalm 23. Uh, well, maybe you know the Lord is my shepherd by heart, but right before that, Psalm 22, I wanna, I wanna read this to you. This is a helpful parallel as we consider the death of Christ. And you'll notice if you turn there in Psalm 22, that right off the bat, the name of the Psalm shares the words of Christ spoken on the cross, why have you forsaken me? And, and just to kind of help you understand what we're about to read, what we're about to read in Psalm 22, it's a song that was written hundreds of years ago uh, before Christ died by King David. And, and David kind of lays out his own suffering. And he explains how, how people are against him and how people are, are after him and how he describes his suffering and how it makes him feel like a worm. He describes how his enemies are, are so evil, they remind him of dogs that ravage bones. He goes on to describe how his heart melts like wax, how his tongue dries up. And he'll even go on to say that his hands and his feet have been pierced just like Christ. And so I, I want us to read this because there are some parallels here that are helpful for us as we understand Mark 15. Psalm 22, King David says this, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, I find no rest. Yet you are holy and throned on the praises of Israel. In you, our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you, they cried and were rescued. In you, they were trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me they make mouths at me. They wag their heads. They say, he trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You make me trust you at my mother's breast. On you was I cast from my birth and from my mother's womb, you have been my God. Be not far from me for trouble is near and there is none to help me. Many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of bastions surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like potsherd and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death for dogs encompass me, a company of evil doers encircled me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and for my clothing, they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion, you who have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. Many of, of the words that I just read from Psalm 22 here uh, likely sound familiar to you if, you've, uh, if you're familiar with uh, Mark 15 and, and what Travis just read. There's, there's a lot of similarities there. And, and why is that? When we read about David's suffering. He describes the suffering. He, does, he describes being abused and, and tormented and, and these enemies that steal and, and mock him. And this is exactly the same experience that Christ has in Mark 15 on the cross. And so why does David write this in Psalm 22 and now Christ is living it out in Mark 15? Well, this is just one example of how all of scripture points to this event at the end of Jesus' life. That's how important it is. It's, it's a little bit of like that, that mystery kind of narrative that we talked about at the beginning, how there's this, some foreshadowing all throughout scripture that point towards the singular event of Christ crucified in Mark 15. And in fact, I would agree that the cross and the, the work of Christ on the cross is the center of all of scripture. And so all of the Old Testament points towards Jesus' death on the cross and all of the New Testament. And, and even as we live out as a New Testament church today points back to this moment in history as well. So let's dive into the text. And what I want you to do is I want you to remember all that was accomplished through the cross of Christ. So uh, a few points, we have four points this morning to walk through. The first thing is this, the cross reminds us of God's sovereign plan. The cross reminds us of God's sovereign plan. Mike Tyson once said that everybody has a plan until you get punched in the mouth, right? Maybe you've heard that before. 
And, and so there's this sense of like, look, we can all plan and all of our human wisdom and all of our uh, strategizing. And the, the, the reality though is, is even though we make plans, we can't plan for everything. We can't plan for these unseen things that may come up. I mean, the last 18 months is a testament to that, right? I mean, for all of our wisdom and our, our intelligence and our strategizing, we could have never seen the last 18 months coming. Maybe some of you guys did in your basements and your tinfoil hats, but like <laughs> most of us probably couldn't, right? There's probably this sense of like, what is, what is going on? And, and for all the frustration, honestly, on the back and forth that maybe you have of government leaders or policies, uh, maybe you feel that way, but I still have to feel some empathy because it is hard to have a good plan. It's hard to make good plans. Uh, look, some of you will sit in the parking lot after service for 20 minutes deciding where to eat brunch, right? It's like, I don't know what to do. I'm not, just tell me what to do. And we, we all need a plan in some ways. And here's the thing. I just wanna point you to this reality that you already know. We serve a God who not only has a plan, but he sees every angle. He has everything uh, within scope. Everything that happens to Jesus here in Mark 15, everything that we just read is all according to the plan of the Father. And so as we look at this passage, starting in verse 21, realize that, that while Jesus has been unjustly sentenced to death by, by not only uh, a, a Roman council, but a Jewish council, he's being led to the public square to be crucified. Everything about the scene it seems kind of chaotic. It seems like there's chaos. It seems like, okay, it doesn't seem like Jesus and God are in control at all. It doesn't feel like the plan is being uh, laid out the way it's supposed to. But here, this church, amazingly, not one moment, not one detail is, is put to waste. Not one moment is, is God out of control in Mark 15. Nothing that we read here in this passage is out of God's hands or accidental. It's all a part of this plan. And Jesus himself is firmly entrenched in God's plan. And even before he gets to the cross, we see this through the story of Simon of Cyrene, who is being asked to carry this cross. Now, Simon of Cyrene in Mark 15, 21, is a North African man, perhaps with Jewish roots. That's why he'd be in Jerusalem during the Passover. And he happens to be there as a part of the crowd. It's kind of this crazy thing happening. And so he shows up, he's there, and he gets pulled in by the authorities to carry the cross as Jesus walks it through this, this, this area, this courtyard area. And Mark also tells us that Simon is the father to two men, Alexander and Rufus. Now, why is this important? Uh, Alexander and Rufus, I, I would imagine, uh, Scripture doesn't say this, but while we may not know who, who these people are, I would imagine that Mark's readers know who Alexander and Rufus are. And so I would probably even go further and say, that's likely true because they are a part of the community of believers. And, and so as, as Mark is talking about what happened to Jesus in these last days, Alexander and Rufus come up and they realize, oh, that's a Simon. That's, that's the father to our friends, Alexander and Rufus. And we're reminded that God's plans are not like our plans because Simon just gets pulled in to the story. And isn't that the way that God works in our life, right? Like we think we have a plan. We think that we have kind of marching orders and perhaps we randomly stumble into a church. Perhaps we randomly stumble into a Bible study or we happen to live by this person who, who is kind of going through the same things that we are. We get invited to a church event and we get this brief momentary contact with the risen Christ. And we think like, that's, that's weird. That's, that's, that's good fortune. That's lucky. And, and, and in fact, no, that's actually God's plan. And, and you and your whole family are, are changed because of that. Some of you, I know sitting here, I'm sure have stories like that, where you happen to have this divine encounter with somebody. And you're like, I, I had no idea that I was gonna be having this conversation today. And your entire life, your entire family tree was changed because of it. This is what happens to si Simon of Cyrene. And even in these little moments, God is working his sovereign plan. God is bringing his people into redemption. That's what we see here in the book of Mark. He's taking uh, what was meant for bad and what was meant for evil and transforming it and making it something that could be redeemable. 
And so one reminder for all of you who may wonder at times, you know, why is it that tragedy happens in our world? It's, it's an age-old question of, you know, if God is in charge, if God is benevolent, if he is good and sovereign and he has a plan, then why does the problem of evil exist in the world? Why, why do we have to deal with the things that we do? And, and look, I can say a lot about this, but for those of you who are in Christ, who put your faith in, in God, just know that it's so that God who is above all would receive glory and know that he is repurposing all that bad for good. And, and we may not see it on this side of heaven. That's just the reality. We're not promised to see how God's plans work out on this side of heaven. But here's the thing. One thing that we can't do is we can't accuse God of excusing his own son from the evil of this world. Because this is exactly what Jesus goes through. There was a purpose for the suffering of Christ and it wasn't realized until after the resurrection. There is a purpose for the suffering in your life. There is a purpose for the suffering in my life. And I just would ask you to be patient, to, to wait on the Lord, to see where, where God is at work in, in your life and realize that he has a plan. And just like Jesus trusted the Father, just like Simon, who was thrown into the mix in Mark 15, trusted the story and was likely forever changed by that experience. And the cross reminds us that God has a plan and a sovereign through it all. That's the first thing that we see. Number two is this. The cross reminds us that Jesus is in willing agreement with the Father. Christ was in willing agreement with the Father. This is something Travis talked to you guys about last week, the willingness of Christ. How he was willing to take on sin and death and go through all this. It's one, it's one thing to have a plan. It's another thing to agree to your part in the plan. And so I have to, this is some conjecture, but I have to imagine that Jesus and the Father are talking before the foundations of the earth about how the world would be redeemed. And there was this like kind of check, like Jesus is like, wait, 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 what's happening at the end of this story? I'm supposed to do what? And, and of course, that's not the way it went down because to answer that question, Jesus was not only okay with the plan, he was in complete agreement with this plan. And we know that because in verses 22 to 32, this section here, starting in 22, all up to 32, these, you see that they marched Jesus to a place that means skull, the, the rock formation on the side of the hill. And along the way, people would, would, were offering him this mild uh, kind of anesthesia known uh, w that was, that was the, uh, to help dull his pain a little bit. So it was wine mixed with myrrh. And what do we see Jesus do? He, he denies this. He says, no, I, I don't want this. He chooses willingly, intentionally to fully experience the misery of, of human sin and evil. He, he's come here to suffer and to die for his enemies. And he wants to be completely in that moment. And it's just a, an example that Christ was willing to do this for us. He wasn't being drug along. And so they crucified Jesus, they divide up his clothing, they gamble them away. And this happens at the third hour, which is about 9 a.m. in the morning. It is so important that we understand Christ's willingness to die for us. Christ, Christ knew, I'd imagine intellectually, he knew that he had to die for, for, for humankind. But in that moment, he was human. He was feeling pain. He was feeling lost and lonely. And so at any point, he could have stopped all of this from happening. He was actually God. And he willingly hung on the cross. He willingly was mocked as the king of the Jews. He was willing to associate himself in his last hour of life with these two criminals who hung on the cross. These three men who are humiliated, cursed on, spit on, and, 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 and made, made a mockery of in front of anyone, everyone there. He's, he's the only innocent person there. And yet he was willing to endure it all. Now, why was Christ willing to endure it all? It's, it's the, the truth that we grew up with in church, that Jesus loves us. That's why he was willing to do this for us. That he, he loved us so much that he was willing to die and suffer and experience all of this that we read in Mark 15. And he was willing to walk through this so that we could have a new life in Christ. All for love, he subjected himself to this. Point number three about the cross. The cross helps us better understand atonement. 
I believe you talked about this last week a little bit too. Uh, atonement, what is atonement? Atonement theologically means that God has done through his son what we could not accomplish on our own. Atonement means that there had to be a price that was paid that we could not bear the weight of. And, and so as a, uh, and as a result, God sent his son to atone for that evil and that sin. And we could never pay it on our own. And so in chapter 15, verses 33 to 34, kind of moving up here, we see that for Jesus, this, this, this pain, this torture went on for three hours until high noon. And, and one thing that I want to point out to you here is in verse 33, how there was darkness over the whole land until that time, until 12 p.m. And so at the time of the day when it was supposed to be the brightest, right? Like high noon, it was actually the darkest. And we may think of that as just being accidental if we weren't aware of the whole story of scripture. Those of you who have read Exodus before, Exodus 10, when God is delivering the Israelites out of Egypt, he cast a plague of darkness over the land. Well, what is the connection here? Well, the connection is because God, the God of Moses and the God of the Israelites is the God of Jesus Christ too. It is the same God. And he works in similar ways. And so in Exodus, we see that the Lord wages war on the gods of Egypt and how the gods of Egypt mistreated their people, how they persecuted their people. And just like the Romans and Jews are trying to do to Christ. And, and, and so God is again waging war against the evil powers of Jesus' day. And Exodus shows that last plague, the death of the firstborn of Egypt. And here... And Mark 15 is the death of the greater firstborn son, who Christ, who is totally obedient, totally perfect in every way. Mark is showing us that Jesus is the greater Passover lamb that was sacrificed for us. This is atonement. This is a, a biblical understanding as we kind of reach from, from the beginning of the Old Testament now to hear the gospels, we see this connection of atonement happening in, in real time. And so Jesus finally cries out, in this common language of Aramaic, this, the opening words of Psalm 22, verse 34, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And this is a very human moment. This is a very raw moment where Christ is forsaken by the Father. Christ is forsaken by the Father. Now it's important, church, to understand that in this moment, Jesus did not hold any any less ability to be God at that moment. Uh, some people may think, well, if, if God and Jesus are one, then if he's forsaken by the Father, does that mean he gave up his, his divinity for that moment? No, that's not, what's not, that's not what's happening here. Jesus did not give up his uh, divinity. Christ did not in any sense exist to be God or to be a member of the Trinity in this moment. He never ceased to be God's son. In, in other words, I have, I have, and you have perhaps too, forsaken my kids before, right? Like we've forgotten them, um, you know, at childcare, or we've, we've left them in places, or we didn't show up when we were supposed to, or maybe we weren't present in their lives when we were supposed to be. But the reality is, is they're still our kids. Even when we forsake them, even when we neglect them, when they need us, they are still our children. And so in the same way, Jesus never stopped uh, being in relationship with the Father. But theologically, what's happening here is it's almost as if God is turning his back for a moment from the Son. So, so why? Why was Jesus forsaken by the Father? Well, it's because Jesus, the Son, took upon himself our transgression, our iniquities. He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf, and he took on that curse for us. And so God, who was holy, could not even look at his Son in that moment. And so he died that death. We deserve so we could live. He atoned for our sins. And this brings us to our last point this morning. The cross points us to a greater victory to come. Next week, we'll hear more about this. And it's an awesome story. And it's a story many of you know. But in verse 34, when, when Jesus calls out, we are reminded of the ultimate truth of Psalm 22. And so again, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn back to Psalm 22 one last time. I, I read the beginning half of it. I want to finish it here. And we see that everything that David goes through in Psalm 22 is hard, it's suffering, but there is hope. 
So Psalm 22 in verse 22 says this, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or bore the affliction of the afflicted and he has not hidden his face from him but has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all you who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, that he has done it. He has done it. Isn't that the point of the cross? Isn't that the, the point of the gospel in, in so many ways that in Christ's suffering, we also see victory? That he has accomplished on our behalf what we can never accomplish on our own. He has done it. In other words, the world will and can be redeemed. And here's the crazy thing. No one's standing at Golgotha that day seems to understand this in Mark 15. The Bible scholars, the synagogue leaders, everybody who was important and had kind of letters at the end of their names, all those smart folks, none of them actually saw what's happening here as Christ died on the cross. You think, they think that Jesus is delusional from pain, that he's crying out for Elijah and nobody understands what's actually happening. And in a moment that should have driven the world to their knees in worship and gratitude, everybody just kind of stands around like it's another crucifixion, like it's another, it's another day. Because of the cross, Story Church, we can have new life. We can have new life. There's victory in the cross. And so let me just ask you, church, those of you who are in Christ today, are you actually living in victory? Or is your posture one uh, that, that, would, that would tell the world that you are different, that you are new, you're a new creation because of what happened on the cross? Or do you, you live like you have been given a brand new life? And I'm certain that some of you are not living in light of the work on the cross. And some of you, nothing has really changed in your own life since being made new in Christ. Let me remind you that because of the cross, the Christian life is a brand new life. It is not a a washed up, better version of your old life. Let me give you an example. Uh, maybe some of you have tried to, to buy a car in this last year. It's been hard, right? I and mean, there's a lot going on. Um, but let's say that you, you have a desire, you wanna trade in your car for a new car. That's the plan, right? You and your spouse or you in your own mind, you're like, I'm gonna, we're gonna do this. We're gonna trade in our old car, get a new car. And so you, you show up to the dealer and uh, and you know, there's all this kind of haggle back and forth, but eventually you, they, they realize that you're serious. And so they get the clipboard out and they start evaluating your old car because you're gonna trade that car in for a new one. And so you sit down to that little room, right? You shake hands, you sign the paper. You're like, all right, let's do it. Let's, let's get a new car. And uh, you go outside and they bring out the new car to you. And they're like, here you go, here's the car. Here's the new one. And uh, it's your old car. And uh, you're like, that's my old car. And you're like, no, 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 that's, that's not the same car. We washed it. We tuned it up, right? Oil change, new decals on the back. It's, it's kind of like a new car. Like, no, it's, you'd be furious, right? This isn't what we talked about. This isn't, this isn't what we, you'd be furious. You'd be, you were aiming to buy a brand new car. You were expecting a brand new car, not the, the same old car that you brought in, uh, just cleaned up. And here's the thing, it's the same with the Christian life. We exchange our old life for a new life in Christ. Not a, just a better version of yourself, because here's the problem with a better version of yourself. It's still you. And you and I are not enough. And so the gospel says that the work on the cross, it, it was the, the pre-work, it was the foundation for the new life we have in Christ. This is what Paul talks all about in the epistles. 
And the cross allows us to exchange what was old for something completely new. And so Story Church, I don't know where you're at this morning, but I just want that question to sit with you today, the rest of this week. Are you living in a way that would communicate to all the people in your life that you have victory in Christ? Or, or are you living kind of in your old ways? This victory was evidenced in the torn veil in verse 38, that Jesus made, his, made a way for relationship between the Father and for us. We didn't work our way up to God. He ripped the dividing wall from top to bottom. And as we wrap this passage up, verses 39 through 47, it closes by telling us about a few more characters in the story. There's a centurion who puts his faith in God at the last kind of moment of Christ's life. The, the women who are eyewitnesses to this whole crucifixion, two important women named Mary, right? Who served with Jesus, who are part of his ministry. And we're also introduced to Joseph of Arimathea. And Mark tells us that Joseph was a man who was searching for the kingdom of God that he was a seeker. He was somebody who was soft-hearted to the truths of, of Scripture and, and what God was talking in his, about his, his life. And so we read that Joseph bravely meets with Pilate and he approaches him and says, hey, can I take the body of Jesus and bury him in my own uh, personal grave? And so he does so. He takes his body down from the cross. He swaddles his body in cloths and lays him in a tomb because there's no other room in Jerusalem for this king. And this starts to sound familiar. And we start to realize that Jesus came, came into this world the same way that he left it. And the story of Christ crucified holds a, a deep meaning for us as believers. We, we realize through this story that we are called to trust God's plans and not our own. We are, we are called to, even when there is pain and suffering and things don't make sense, to put our hope in the sovereignty of God's plans and not our own plans. The cross reminds us that out of Christ's love for us, that he willingly went to the cross for, our, for us on our behalf so he could atone for our sins. Atoning was, atonement was God's accomplishing through his son what we can never do even on our very best day. And so, Again, I wanna remind you, the rest of scripture makes little sense if we don't understand the cross of Christ. And so how fitting is it that here this Sunday in the middle of Advent, we've read scripture, we've sung songs about the love of, of God. Uh, we, can, we can be reminded that all of this, this season that we are in of arrival and waiting for Jesus, it was all initiated by the arrival of a baby. That because of the kindness of the manger, we can experience the power of the cross. There, there's something uh, thoughtful and important that we should rest on in that moment. That Christmas means something because Good Friday means something. And so next week, we will be reminded even further, as Paul told us, it doesn't matter what Jesus did or said or any of the influential or powerful things that he accomplished. Uh, if Jesus did not raised from the grave, we as Christians above all should be pitied the most. And yet the truth is, praise God, the truth is the story doesn't end with Jesus in a tomb forever. It ends with him resurrected for us on our behalf. And so I would encourage you to come back next week to hear more about how this, this, this wraps up and this uh, glorious conclusion, okay? Let's bow our heads together and pray and uh, we'll take the Lord's Supper. God, we are grateful for this time that we've had. Lord, I, I pray that as we reflect on the cross, as we reflect on this story that many of us in this room perhaps have even heard preached before or we've read before, Lord, I, I pray that there would be a renewed reminding of the impact of the work you did on the cross, why it was so important for us, why we didn't have anything to bring to the table to start with and, and how we can have victory because of the cross and the empty grave. Lord, I pray that that would, would hit us in a, a, a new way this morning. God, would you, through your Holy Spirit, convict us of sin, Lord, where we think that we can, we can do our, our life on our own without your help. And God, yet as Psalm 22 reminds us, you have done the work. You have accomplished what we have not. Lord, I pray that if, if anybody is, is far from you this morning, God, that this this time, this time of, of liturgy, this time of reminding uh, ourselves about who the church is would be a way to draw people who are far from you close to your son, Jesus Christ. 
that they would see close up the work that you've done and accomplished on our behalf. We love you. We thank you for the cross. We praise in your name. Amen. Amen.